from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. It is an extreme pleasure to introduce to you the next Justice of the West Virginia Supreme Court, Brent Benjamin. On election night 2004, Massey Energy CEO Don Blankenship was a happy man. We're hoping to have a celebration tonight. Looks like we will. As returns were coming in for the Supreme Court race, it was becoming clear that Republican newcomer Brent Benjamin was going to defeat incumbent Justice Warren McGraw. It wasn't just by chance. Blankenship had spent more than $3 million to unseat McGraw. And in the years since that Supreme Court victory, Blankenship has not retreated back to the Massey boardroom. He spent over a million dollars more on ads to influence public policy. First, against an amendment to sell bonds to fund state pensions. They need to totally open Then, a, a campaign to remove the food tax. Call the politicians. Tell them to in the process, the he's upending the political playing field in West Virginia. Of the food tax now. Most of what Don tells you is the truth. In, in dollars and cents terms, if you want to call it that. But a lot of people in West Virginia don't want to hear that. If Don Blankenship didn't have millions of dollars, he would be the person you would avoid in a grocery store. Uh, but because he brings millions of dollars to, to the table, people have to listen. I don't care what people think. You know, at, at the end of the day, Don Blankenship is going to die with more money than he needs. On tonight's Outlook, The Kingmaker. I want to give you a man who has caused seismic shockwaves in the political fabric, but I can tell you, it's only a prelude to the earthquake that's coming. I look at the man, his methods, and his meaning in West Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Blankenship. I grew up in what many people consider the toughest town in Mingo County in Delorme, which is on the border of uh, Pike County and not too far from Virginia, which are both were dry counties, and it was a very rough area. Born in 1950, Donald Leon Blankenship was raised by his mother, along with two brothers and a sister. Since then, for a man whose influence continues to expand, his life has centered around a roughly 25-square-mile area, around Delorme, Maitwan, Sprigg, and Belfry, Kentucky. Two things are immediately apparent driving the area's crooked roads. First, coal is everywhere, swelling over rail cars and coal trucks on the knees of men at the gas station. Second, the Kentucky-West Virginia border crisscrosses throughout, but it's easy to distinguish between the two. The Kentucky side is where most of the businesses are located. I am a West Virginian. I've been a West Virginian about 45 of my 55 years and live in West Virginia today. Blankenship's current residence is in Sprigg, between Matewan and Williamson, and he also has a new house on a mountaintop across the Tug Fork in Kentucky. I was reared in a gas station grocery store, so I put gasoline in coal miners' cars for a long time and got to understand what coal miners were about and what their struggles were. After completing college, like many at that time, uh, couldn't find a job, left for a while, and then came back uh, to Massey Energy in 1982. When I was growing up, I would hear about, people would say something about so-and-so made his money and left, you know, and I've heard that all, all my life, but Don, he's, he's still here. He has been very dedicated to West Virginia. Uh, he's, he has not uh, adopted uh, the, the Richmond, Virginia social lifestyle, and uh, in fact, he's, he's avoided it wherever possible. This kind of money is rare in Mingo County and attracts a certain reverence. Ask locals about Massey Energy, the corporation, and they often answer by referring to what he does in the community. The Massey logo is connected to many community projects in Mingo County. I don't have anything bad to say about the man. I know what he's done, and I, I've, I've witnessed it. I've, the town of Mate One, where I'm from, has been the recipient of some of his generosity, but the whole area has. When Johnny Fullen was mayor of Matewan, he was just launching a renovation of the historic town when a fire blew through downtown. All grant applications were put on hold. Blankenship called Fullen to see how he could help. 
Two days later, he called, told me to stop by his office, and I picked up a $50,000 check. No strings attached. Now that's Don Blankenship to me. Unlike most CEOs, Don Blankenship does not work out of a high rise in a big city. He operates out of a trailer in Belfry, Kentucky, just across the river from Mingo County. He's a busy man. I mean, I've been old, I was in their office one day and got a call from some person in the German government, you know. And uh, I was with him one day, one other time, and uh, I'm thinking Carl Rove or somebody called. One other time I was with him, uh, he had just gotten back from a meeting with Henry Kissinger. I guess that's impressive, isn't it? <laughs> Fullen now works for a Massey contractor, and he's one of the few supporters of Blankenship to speak on camera. Many, including an older brother, asked if we had Blankenship's permission before answering questions. Blankenship's detractors are also quieter these days. Several public officials who have criticized Blankenship in the past declined to be interviewed. Blankenship's been controversial in his home county since he came back to work for Massey, then A.T. Massey. Don had, uh, had worked as a coal miner in order to get uh, his education and to earn his CPA certificate. And actually he was uh, working at a bread company uh, in, uh, in the south and Don was more than happy to get back to his home, home county. We're standing up for what's right. And bless God, we're going to continue to stand up for what's right. And if winter time comes around again and there's 18 inches of snow and we've not got a contract, we'll be here then. Yeah. We're going to be here. By 1984, when Massey was embroiled in a United Mine Workers strike, Blankenship was president of a company subsidiary near Mate One. E. Morgan Massey was his boss at the time. Uh, there was a truck driver that was killed, and uh, they shot holes through Don's office. Uh, he had to put armor plate in, 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 in his personal vehicle. So it, was, it was pretty dreadful down there. I was safely here in Richmond, but he was on the forefront of that. What you have to accept in a capitalist society generally is that I always make the comparison it's like a jungle or a jungle survival of the fittest. Unions, communities, people, everybody's going to have to learn to accept that in the United States you have a capitalist society and that capitalism from a business viewpoint is survival of the most productive. And you may have a year, two years, five year periods where lesser productive companies or people have benefit, but in the long term it's going to be the most productive people who benefit. In 1985, Blankenship told the Associated Press, quote, undoubtedly I'm the most hated man in Mingo County and the fact that he was a native son fighting the Union did not go unnoticed. It was some tough times there. And I think the people was, was probably a little bit impressed and a little bit surprised. After a 15-month strike, the UMW and A.T. Massey agreed on a contract, but by that time, Massey had closed or contracted out many of its operations, and the UMW never recovered at Massey. Today, only 170 of Massey's more than 5,500 employees are represented by a union. If you're not union and you're able to pay a comparable benefit payment, it might cost you 20% of, of what the union pension plan costs you. What that means is not that I'm in for or against it. What that means is that non-union competitors have a tremendous advantage and therefore they sell coal cheaper and drive union coals out of, out of business. There's more non-union minds now because of his philosophical view to do anything humanly possible to keep the union out. Within eight years of the strike's conclusion, Blankenship was chairman and CEO of A.T. Massey. His mastery is the, is the uh, complex cost, income side of a, of, a, of a very complicated public company. And he knows every nook and cranny, if you will, be of the, of the cost uh, system. And uh, uh, that's, that's, I think, what motivates uh, Don. Upon his retirement in 1992, E. Morgan Massey says Blankenship was the obvious choice to replace him over more senior executives. Blankenship, the accountant, had command over the company's numbers. Don does all of that almost single-handedly. 
uh, he's accused of being a micromanager. And, and I guess in, the, in, the, in a sense uh, that may be true, but uh, uh, he's certainly right on top of everything that's going on in his company. But the ranks of his detractors have swelled during his tenure. He continues to be a target of the UMW. And he attracted the rancor of environmentalists as mountaintop removal mining accelerated in the mid-1990s and Massey accrued repeated environmental violations. In October of 2000, the same month Massey Energy became a publicly traded company, a coal impoundment in Martin County, Kentucky broke, spilling 300 million gallons of coal sludge that made its way to the Tug Fork and the Big Sandy River along the West Virginia border. And coalfield communities joined in the criticism of Blankenship. He is single-mindedly focused on the bottom line for that company. Charleston attorney Brian Glasser has filed and won two lawsuits against Massey. A jury awarded Glasser's clients nearly half a million dollars because a Massey operation was leaving coal dust throughout Sylvester and Boone County. And in a $1.6 million verdict, a jury found Massey responsible for damaging the well water of Del Barton residents in Mingo County. Basically, the way that he processed that information in both these cases was to say that there are ways they can get compensation if they got a case they can prove. It's through the courts, and it's just part of the externalities of doing business, and there's not a lot more he can do about it. The experience also showed Glasser how Blankenship deals with opposition. You talk to an old lawyer, right? An old lawyer may say, you know, Brian, when you're negotiating with somebody, you need to, don't take the last dollar. Give them, let them take their pride home from the negotiating table. They can let them take a little money home. You don't have to beat them into the ground. I would say that you probably wouldn't hear that from him. Massey says Blankenship also alienated some within his company with his top-down leadership style. There have been a lot of good people who have worked for Don that have left because in their opinion, Don get, didn't give them enough authority. And uh, Don's management style is that of wanting to know everything that's going on and, and make, making most of the decisions. Just a few days before the 2002 election and a few days before we oust the Senate finance chairman. As Don Blankenship was navigating challenges at Massey and earning millions of dollars in the process, Marshall County native Greg Thomas was sharpening his political chops. Thomas, the son of a coal miner, attended the exclusive Lindsley School in Wheeling in Hampton Sydney College in Virginia. While a student at the all-male college, his politics shifted to the right. By the time he graduated in 1999, he had already established himself as an effective spokesman in conservative politics. He worked in Republican campaigns in Virginia in 2000 and 2001 then served as press secretary for a Virginia congressman on Capitol Hill. The pathway to prosperity for West Virginia is the Republican vision. Thomas's resume found its way to then-delegate Lisa Smith in 2002. She was mounting a challenge of the powerful Senate finance chairman, Oshel Crago. Thomas brought his Washington playbook back to West Virginia as Smith's campaign manager. Delegate Mitch Carmichael, whose district overlapped with Crago's Senate seat, says Thomas's arrival coincided with the increased sophistication of campaigns in West Virginia. He's definitely brought that expertise to West Virginia by targeting certain elements, using uh, information at his disposal. Um, and, you know, in terms of getting out the message in the proper media format. The campaign centered on the hot-button issues of the day, doctors leaving the state and the expansion of gambling. But Smith's ads also focused on Crago's votes concerning homosexuals and a reported federal investigation against Crago. Crago believes it's a hallmark of Thomas's style. I think Greg's uh, uh, strategy is to be negative. He's very negative. I think he was very negative against McGraw. And, uh, and you know, obviously it, it worked. But Delegate Carmichael maintains it was gambling and Crago's vote to legalize gray machines that was the deciding factor. At the same time, he allowed that the campaign did get dirty. The problem with negative campaigning is it works. And uh, uh, Greg Thomas realizes that. The campaign managers for Senator Crago realize that. And uh, so it, it works to the extent that it motivates people to make a decision. With Thomas's help, Smith won with 55% of the vote, though she's since resigned from the Senate. Thomas moved on to become a leader with West Virginia Citizens Against Lawsuit Abuse. All oh, this trash! This garbage that my opponents pay millions of dollars to put on television. 
And then came the perfect storm of the 2004 Supreme Court election. Incumbent Justice Warren McGraw, a target of business groups and doctors, had won the Democratic primary. His challenger, Republican attorney Brent Benjamin, was unknown. Together, Blankenship and Thomas sought to change that. Don Blankenship is able to provide resources to, to shine the light on the situation here in West Virginia, and Greg knows how to utilize those resources to, in the most effective manner to, to display what's happening here in the halls of the Capitol and in West Virginia. Thomas declined to be interviewed, as did Rob Cornelius, a consultant who also works for Blankenship. Prior to the 2004 election, Blankenship had made political contributions, individually and through Massey. And even though he contributed $100,000 of corporate money for a new state Republican Party headquarters in 2002, his relationship with the National Party has been strained at times. He came to a, a meeting we had uh, for a White House briefing uh, at the new party headquarters, in fact. And the guy who was there from the White House was kind of doing his briefing and then asked for any questions. And uh, you know, Don leaned forward and started to talk and started to tell the Bush administration and this guy from the White House everything that the Bush administration was doing wrong, everything they were uh, making mistakes about, and went on for a good 20, 25 minutes <laughs> without a break. <laughs> and uh, you know, the guy from the White House later was pretty furious about it, but uh, that's Don Blankenship. He doesn't care who he's talking to. He's going to tell you what he thinks. In early 2004, it wasn't known if Blankenship's support was a liability or an asset in politics. McGraw's challenger in the Democratic primary declined any help from Blankenship. I offered to be very helpful to Jim Rowe, so probably shouldn't say that at a Republican meeting. But uh, I think that Mr. Rowe and so forth decided that my influence or my help might actually be a negative during the Democratic campaign. But 2004 was the year of 527s. The IRS designation allowed unlimited financial contributions, as long as groups did not explicitly tell the public who to vote for. 527s were proliferating at the national and state level, including Consumers for Justice, a group funded by trial attorneys in support of McGraw. I think it's born out of frustration and him saying, you know what, I'm frustrated with the Democrats, I'm frustrated with the Republicans, I'm just going to do this myself. And I think he talked to lawyers in, in 2004 he saw the other 527 groups springing up uh, from the right and the left and said, I think I'll just do this myself. Thomas started a private consulting business in early August 2004, and two weeks later, and for the sake of the kids, was born. Soon, billboards with the slogan crafted by Blankenship himself were popping up across West Virginia. We were driving down the road and I saw a political billboard and it said, who is Brent Benjamin? Actually, I saw one about every hundred yards. And for the sake of the kids and Blankenship's independent expenditure filings demonstrate a sophisticated, multidimensional media onslaught. There was internal polling, billboards, automatic telephone calls, bumper stickers, commercial production, and multimedia ad buys, including a 30-minute infomercial. The ads focused on McGraw's vote to give probation to Tony Arbaugh, a convicted sex offender who violated parole by using drugs. Other ads featured McGraw himself at a Democratic campaign rally. Don had a lot of, he had a lot of professionals around him. He had a lot of good advice and, and people that he would work with to take whatever ideas he had, at least the concepts, and put them into use. So uh, I think that what, 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 is, what has been different is to the extent uh, that those things have been used simply because of the availability of resources that haven't been available in the past. We need to do fundamental changes in West Virginia. We need to use a chainsaw as opposed to a little pair of scissors to make some of those changes. Blankenship has continued to use Thomas's public relations services for both politics and Massey Energy. He's not concerned about mixing business with politics. After declaring himself a radical at the Republican Summer Conference, he explained his belief that what's good for his company is good for everyone. Why am I radical? It's basically because, not because I want to change the business climate. The Republicans have a reputation among average West Virginians and average Americans of being business, business, business. We've got to do a better job of making this connection between the fact that business is what causes people to have quality of life. If you don't have a job, you'll never have a good environment. To do that, he would like to decrease the number of boards of education, eliminate the budget digest, and make regulation more business friendly. But when you go to eliminate non-tax burdens on business, who, why is that not easy to do. Who's it going to hurt to reduce the, the burdens on business? Who's it going to hurt 
for me at Massey to be able to get a permit in one or two years versus seven or eight years. He has said he will spend money next year to defeat legislators who voted for a 1% cut in the food tax instead of repealing it altogether. For the benefit of those of you that have a vote over in the legislature, I said to the Beckley Herald that you love, your love of Bob Kiss and Joe Manchin is greater than your concern for the taxpayers of West Virginia. And although he said he hopes to see Republicans take control of the legislature, his relationship with the party is not clear cut. Blankenship can spend money more freely on his own. Gary Abernathy, the former executive director of the state Republican Party, would like to see more coordination. I think he, he's a guy who wants to accomplish some things and has just decided to accomplish them and has found a way to do it with his own money. Um, I personally hope he doesn't continue to go entirely that route. I think he's, I think he's still stronger with the party at his side uh, and working through the Republican Party. But Cecil Roberts contends that alone or with the party, Blankenship's money is what makes him powerful. If Don Blankenship didn't have millions of dollars, he would be the person you would avoid in a grocery store. Uh, but because he brings millions of dollars to, to the table, people have to listen because he'll sue you. Uh, and, if you don't li and if he doesn't sue you, he'll run some ads and make you look bad, or he'll run ads to change people's opinion. And that's, that's the reality of the situation. Wealth will do a lot of things, uh, no matter what you're talking about in our society, whether it's politics or influencing certain situations, or just out-and-out out raw power. During the food tax debate, in what was Blankenship's first campaign involving a legislative issue, he caucused with Senate Republicans at the Capitol. That prompted Governor Joe Manchin to accuse Republicans of selling out to Blankenship. That didn't sit well with Delegate Carmichael. He's spending his personal money to benefit West Virginia. And I don't think he, I don't sense, and I certainly don't feel as a Republican delegate, beholden to him in any way. I think we all still vote our conscience and what's right, but in most cases, uh, Don Blankenship is aligned with the Republican Party. And whether talking business or politics, Blankenship is noted for his unvarnished delivery of what he considers the facts. He tells the truth in terms of, of what is going on. A lot of times people don't want to hear the truth, but... Uh, 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 he, he's pretty always uh, right in terms of, of what can be done and what cannot be done. So it's, it's, and perhaps if there's a criticism of it, it maybe he's a little too matter-of-fact about it. Blankenship also continues to have his sights on the Supreme Court and hopes to unseat Justice Larry Starcher. When Vladimir Putin went to a Western study group and asked what they needed in Russia, he was told a fair press and a fair judicial system. And it's really unfortunate that we don't have or have not historically had either of those in West Virginia. And it's one of the reasons I've been so focused on those two areas. We need to focus on becoming what we can be and not on what we are and how to improve it. Blankenship's that opinion of the media like is also like transforming the way the public picture. receives his message. Pollster Mark Blankenship, no relation, explained how the proliferation of new media is changing politics at the State Republican Summer Conference. Don Blankenship is a client of Mark Blankenship's employer, RMS Strategies. If the Charleston Gazette you don't believe is giving you the fair angle on a story, do not claim the death of your campaign or your calls as a result of it, because there are other ways to communicate with the public. It's a strategy Blankenship and Thomas employ. I don't feel like that uh, people understand my purpose. My purpose is actually to see West Virginia join the mainstream of America has nothing to do with the Gazette per se or the reporters at the Gazette or the other reporters in the state. But Paul Nyden, investigative journalist for the Charleston Gazette, disagrees. He does not interact at all with a certain percentage of people in the media. He loves to do TV ads that he can pay for. And uh, I think he keeps a quite distant relationship from anybody who he thinks might have any criticism of him. Hoppy Kerchival, host of a popular statewide radio talk show, is a beneficiary of the approach. Blankenship is a frequent guest of Kerchival's and broke the news on his program in August that Massey was pulling out of the West Virginia Coal Association. There are certain news sources that might feel a certain media outlet is unfair to them, but they still feel compelled to talk to them or have to talk to them because they're politicians or whatever. And then there are people such as Blankenship who simply are people of means and, and uh, are of a certain conviction and they feel like they just don't have to talk to all media. I've brought suit against the Charleston Gazette, which, in my opinion, will also prevail. 
Blankenship is also is taking his campaign against his critics, including the media, to court. In June, he and Massey Energy sued the Charleston Gazette, the UMW and Cecil Roberts, West Virginia Consumers for Justice, and state AFL-CIO leader Kenny Perdue for defamation. Massey Energy has also threatened to sue West Virginia Public Broadcasting. He cannot take criticism of any kind. Uh, he's like a, uh, a child that's spoiled, and if you say anything to that child that's spoiled, they get all very upset. That's non-blankenship. But he is also a very powerful person who can hire the best lawyers in the world, and he knows he may very well not win any of this, these suits, but he says, well, Cecil Roberts doesn't make anywhere near the kind of money that would justify him spending money out of his pocket to defend himself, so I'll just cause him as many problems as I can, and I'll just ruin him. And he sued Governor Manchin in July, charging that the governor violated his right to free speech and retaliated against him for his campaign against the pension bond amendment. The governor's staff has called the lawsuit frivolous, and state Democratic Party chairman Nick Casey says the lawsuits are designed to intimidate. Lawsuits chill people. Lawsuits and fear of lawsuits chill many people. And I think that's another result of this last campaign and the actions that have occurred is that many people, and you're looking at one, are very chilled and very cautious about what they're prepared to say about people and what they think about people. And that is terrible. It is so contrary to the American's right to say what they think without fear of attack, without fear of financial effect. Delegate Carmichael sees the lawsuits differently. As just a uh, kind of a bystander and looking at it, I think he was provoked in a lot of those scenarios. Uh, you know, uh, if he has a legitimate gripe or a legitimate complaint, a private citizen has a right and cannot be bullied by the government or by a, uh, or slandered by a newspaper. I look around all these cameras and the press, and I think they're following me everywhere. Uh, <laughs> my greatest hope is that they'll follow me to prosperity in West Virginia. Don Blankenship's contract with Massey expires in December. But regardless of his employment status, it appears he'll be a player in state politics for some time. In September, the legislature approved spending limits on 527s, but they'll have no impact on Blankenship if he runs his own campaign and love him or hate him, that money is having an impact on West Virginia politics. For some, he's breaking the state free from the grips of the historical power brokers. I think it's a wonderful change because I'm telling you, prior to that, there was no concern about a vote here, how it would play back home in their individual districts. There's just no concern about that because, um, unfortunately, the name recognition of a particular candidate, an existing delegate, normally, I mean, you look at the history of the re-election rates, it's very, very high. Don Blankenship isn't pulling any punches and isn't being, uh, you know, secretive about that. It says it up front. If you vote this way, you're voting against what the people of West Virginia want. We think we have a better way to do it, and we're going to find a candidate and utilize that against you. So. You know, and that's the way it works, and that's the way it should work. Others see it as an unwelcome return to West Virginia's past. Many, many years ago, uh, I'm told, I never observed this myself, that you could go to the legislature and look up in the gallery, and a bill would come up that affected the coal industry. And some legislators, unfortunately many legislators, would turn and look to the gallery to look for the Roman thumbs up or thumbs down from that particular, in those days, coal baron who was trying to run the legislature. That's what Don Blankenship and me reminds me of. And others see it as another example of an old truth in politics. Is it fair that money equals voice in the public discourse? No, that's probably not fair, but that's the American way, right? It's been that way since actually the 17 and 1800s in America, so I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. So frankly, what he's doing with his you know, personal wealth is not unlike what people have done throughout history in America with their personal wealth. And the United States Supreme Court said that uh, money equals speech, and so long as that's the rule in, 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 um, in America, then people can do it, and probably should. I mean, you can spend your money any way you want.